I'm Dr. Derek Cooney, I'm filling in for Christian Knudsen as the, he is our primary host. Uh, he's on vacation, as is, uh, are a lot of people, and uh, being the last day of the academic calendar, um, uh, this is an interesting time to have our, our, um, our talk, but we've got a great one today, and so I'm glad you guys uh, joined us, and uh, as usual, uh, we were recording, and we'll be posting this on the uh, EMS Medicine Live website, um, and so it'll be available for uh, viewing later. Uh, today, it's uh, Air Medical Services and Flight Physiology, and I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment. Um, just as a reminder, EMS Medicine's live vision is to provide a community and academic EMS physician education source with information sharing and board preparation materials. Uh, group involvement is essential to uh, this project, and um, it's an opportunity to additionally meet and see our peers uh, outside of uh, usual conferences and meetings, and to also involve uh, your unique experiences and skills, and also as a vehicle to educate ourselves uh, and our fellows and residents. Course directors are uh, Chris Knudsen, myself, and Brian Clemency. Um, and uh, just to review the ground rules for Zoom, uh, during the presentation, everyone will be muted uh, so that our primary speaker can be uninterrupted uh, by background noise. Um, you can chat questions to EMS Medicine Live, or Knudsen, it's the same account this time, uh, to be answered either during or at the end of the presentation. Um, you can raise your hand virtually in the chat window, uh, which is a feature of Zoom, and it's one of your, uh, your buttons that you can click on. And again, uh, we will be recording and uh, it will be available uh, on the site and on the, um, um, the uh, various accounts that EMS Medicine Live has set up. Um, again, we'll do the questions at the end for the most part. Uh, unmute yourself if you need, when you ask a question or no one will be able to hear you. It's like that classic conference call where it's silence but someone's talking. Um, and if there's any technical problems, uh, go ahead and email Chris and he can fix it for next time. Today's presenter is Christian Martin Gill uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. He's Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine, Associate Director of EMS uh, Fellowship, the Associate Medical Director of UPMC's Pre-Hospital Care, and mm -hmm. Associate Medical Director of Stat Medivac. So we're very proud and uh, happy to have him here today. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and queue up his presentation and we'll get started. All right. Fair enough. Um, all right, so we got a few folks on. Actually, I didn't see that we had a, uh, these folks. So good. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, coming on, and uh, let's get this done. So uh, I was asked to, uh, to share something, and uh, actually uh, uh, the majority of this presentation, actually all of it, I condensed it to a one-hour talk. But it was put together actually uh, for uh, uh, NAMSP and specifically with input from the Air Medicine Committee and the Education Committee uh, from this initial push of trying to get uh, some content uh, that may be more challenging for some fellowships to be able to provide because maybe they don't have a certain specialty EMS thing at their shop or uh, as, as close or ties to it. Uh, or maybe even just to get some input from a different uh, a program and whatnot. Uh, so actually, uh, in the initial uh, push of this, we made an air medical presentation, a tactical EMS presentation. Uh, I got to spearhead this uh, air medicine and flight physiology one. Uh, and so I've condensed it here, uh, and I'll kind of talk quickly so we are done by uh, 2 o'clock. And uh, uh, we'll just kind of uh, run through some stuff. And... Uh, the goals are uh, to basically uh, talk about uh, uh, air medicine as a whole, then talk specifically about some flight physiology and some clinical applications if uh, you're an EMS physician uh, that is going to be providing medical oversight uh, or actually flying uh, there. Uh, and uh, there's some good work happening here. There's uh, currently a, uh, the NMSP position statement on education of flight physicians and uh, folks is currently being rewritten. And uh, certainly there's interest in advancing the knowledge of air medicine among our community of EMS physicians. So 
uh, you know, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the, the background and the purpose of air medical uh, transport. So generally, we're flying folks either from the scene or inter-facility transfers uh, for critically ill or injured patients. Our goal is to transfer people in a safe, efficient, and expert manner uh, and recognize that the environment that we work in is particularly unpredictable. And that is very true for all of EMS and particularly true when you are trying to do it at 2,000 feet up in the air with this big rotor ahead of, uh, above you uh, and all of the other challenges that may happen with air medical transport. Uh, and an interesting uh, uh, historical view of this uh, that I typically bring up when I talk about our medicine is just the history of where medical transport came from. And it really came from the Korean conflict and then the Vietnam War and what you need to think about here is you, you you know, maybe most of us just watch this on TV. Uh, some folks, uh, you know, could have uh, lived this. Uh, but the concept of air medical transport in one time was actually a litter on the outside of a helicopter on either side that you strap your patient to and then you transport them to where their care actually is. And so it became very important that you provided some kind of life-sustaining uh, treatment on scene uh, and then you went through the period of transport with no care being delivered to the patient until you arrived at the next higher level of care in a, in a battlefield setting. And so air medical transport, it started its roots on the rapid evacuation of patients without the delivery of much care en route. And in fact, that model has stayed through the, uh, uh, through the military for a lot of years until more recently where the military has moved more towards our civilian model of providing quite a lot of medical care during the transport phase. Uh, you know, there's a development of trauma systems. Uh, this is how uh, we uh, developed trauma systems in the United States, recognizing that it was, uh, you know, potentially better to be shot in your chest in the middle of a battlefield somewhere else than it was on Main Street. And so trauma systems got developed and air medical programs got developed. And so early on, air medical programs were just for trauma patients, much like EMS was in the early days. And then it has expanded to really the management of all sorts of critical illnesses, emergency conditions, uh, to include trauma and non-trauma conditions. And in modern days, we not only provide a very high level of care during that transport phase, uh, but there also is a, a culture of safety uh, fact that we need to make this transport environment as safe as possible uh, that can uh, have participation of strong medical direction from physician medical directors that are knowledgeable and uh, very involved in those air medical programs, that there are quality assurance, quality improvement programs in place, and then we have robust evidence-based uh, protocols uh, and policies in place uh, that we can utilize. Talk a little, bit, a little bit about different aircraft that uh, you may come across. Uh, typically, there are two versions, rotor aircraft and fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, rotor aircraft, uh, uh, benefit of it is that you don't need an airport. You basically need a 100 by 100 foot landing zone. Uh, that has come up on some uh, exams uh, that I know of uh, in different settings uh, about, you know, uh, what would make a safe landing zone for an air medical uh, helicopter, and so uh, 100 by 100 foot is typically a standard uh, period of, uh, of space, and certainly we want to make sure that that's free of wires and poles and trees and other hazards that might be present there. Uh, another benefit is that you can do door-to-door -door transport, and uh, this can be particularly important as we compare it with fixed-wing uh, missions. So I recently had the opportunity to fly a patient from the University of Pittsburgh to Johns Hopkins Hospital. And uh, this was a patient with pulmonary fibrosis that had a very high oxygen requirement. Uh, she actually had a 40 liter uh, oxymizer mask. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, if you think about that, you know, uh, 40 liters is, uh, 4 liters a minute is just a huge suck on oxygen. And uh, we just don't carry that much oxygen on a helicopter. Uh, so we could uh, uh, do a fixed wing mission with that, but then issue that would happen is that you have transitions of care. So if you're in a hospital, then you have to transition to an ambulance to take you to an airport, then transition into the airplane, uh, 
From the airplane, you're going to the other airport where you're going to transition into another ambulance and ultimately transition onto a hospital bed at the receiving facility. And it turned out that as soon as you said the word move to this patient, she desaturated to 60%. I mean, it was amazing. It was, she just, I mean, you look at her and she was just plummet down uh, 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 very profoundly. And uh, this was somebody that, that, that was, uh, we were trying to avoid intubating specifically for evaluation for a lung transplant. And so, uh, you know, one benefit of rotor is that it's point to point. So we ended up actually completing the mission by rotor placing her on BiPAP and doing some things to maximize oxygen use and actually being able to put her on our stretcher directly in an aircraft and then landing at that facility as a door-to-door -door transport. So now you can have one example of how it can become particularly useful to be able to have that door-to-door -door service. Uh, aircraft typically fly about 120 miles an hour, so I like to think about it as two miles a minute when I do my calculations and I think of how many miles away they are from the, from the uh, hospital. Typical service area that might come up on an exam question is 100 miles, uh, typical service area, but in terms of, um, if you look at different aircraft and their range, as we'll discuss in a minute, the range may be better described as something like 350 to 450 miles, but a typical service area in terms of a, a ring around a base and whatnot is about 150 miles. They'll typically fly at lower altitudes, somewhere between one and 4,000 feet, and more commonly around the two to maybe 3,000 foot range. And we compare this with, with fixed wing aircraft where you need an airport to land to and from. Uh, certainly they fly uh, much faster, and this depends on whether it's a propeller or a jet uh, airplane, and they uh, travel at higher altitudes. So when we're talking about flight physiology and a lot of the things that happen up in altitude, we're largely talking about fixed wing transports uh, in the things that can happen when you have a cabin pressure of 68,000 feet, which it collaborates to, uh, which with, that is typical when you have an aircraft flying anywhere between 20 and 40,000 feet. So uh, in terms of uh, rotor wing uh, uh, engine or uh, rotor wing aircraft, we have single engine rotor aircraft. They're less expensive to operate. You can imagine that the fuel cost uh, burning one engine versus two engine is, is nearly half the cost. Uh, it, it can unfortunately be associated with some reduced safety margins. Uh, in the safety piece of it, uh, when you look at air, uh, aircraft crashes that have involved single engine uh, rotors that was a, potentially attributable to that, it happens in one of two environments. One is that you have an engine failure. Unfortunately, an engine failure in a single engine aircraft uh, uh, can be particularly problematic. Uh, you can try to auto-rotate to uh, land on the ground, but you certainly have uh, much uh, less room for any kind of uh, maneuvering and control than when you have another engine still working. And uh, the other issue that can occur is uh, when you are uh, down near the ground and are getting ground effect, uh, and you can, if you don't have enough power uh, managing that tail rotor and the uh, propeller and, and uh, the uh, uh, tail rotor uh, combination, then you can uh, have uh, what's called a loss of tail rotor effect and you can actually go into a, a spin that uh, causes the tail to crash into something nearby like a tower at a helipad. And so uh, those have been some concerns that have been raised about single engine aircraft, though many of them are operated in, in quite a number of uh, sites across the country. There's also typically no instrument uh, flight rules capabilities to be able to fly in inclement weather. Uh, but uh, some advantages are that it can fly at higher altitudes, typically in very hot uh, ambient uh, temperatures, uh, and so there are some uh, benefits uh, to these types of aircraft. And then we have twin-engine uh, aircraft. Uh, these folks uh, can have some uh, additional power that's available uh, that is uh, particularly important for landing and takeoff operations. They have a second engine, which is particularly useful if one uh, malfunctions in flight. And uh, there are a number of other capabilities that are typically available on uh, twin engine rotors that are not available on single engine rotors, like instrument flight rules capabilities. Uh, some newer models having de-icing capabilities, terrain and collision avoidance systems and whatnot. But certainly they're much more expensive to operate. There are other, even larger rotor wing aircraft that are typically thought of as having multi-missions. So, for example, 
the uh, Maryland State Police uh, primarily operates uh, the Dolphin, uh, which is also known as the EC-155 uh, from Eurocopter. It's a large aircraft. Uh, here you see the a model operated by the um, Coast Guard. And um, uh, you can certainly uh, have other capabilities of that, whether you're using it for dual missions of uh, uh, police and uh, EMS, as well as for fire, for uh, search and rescue, and for other capabilities. Fixed-wing medium-range aircraft are things like the King Air, the Apolitas, uh, that typically fly about 200 or 300 uh, miles an hour. Uh, they are certainly more inexpensive to operate than the jets. Uh, it can it can be uh, configured um, uh, for you know all-weather flight. And then our longer-range aircraft, like the Lear's, uh, have uh, much greater speed. They can go, you know, intercontinental and can do international missions and things like that. But of course, the most expensive to operate out of all the aircraft we've discussed. Configuration of crews really, really varies across the United States and probably varies even more when you look uh, internationally. Typically, it's at least a two-person crew. That crew is either uh, two nurses, a nurse and a paramedic, or a nurse and a physician. Uh, in some cases, a respiratory therapist will replace one of those providers. And then you have some other uh, uh, specialty teams where you may have a, um, uh, uh, like an LVAD technologist, uh, again, the respiratory therapist that may replace one of the crew members. Uh, you may have folks that make up part of a pediatric team, like a pediatric intensivist or a neonatologist that uh, can replace other folks. So often for the specialty teams, you'll end up with at least three providers, but the most common configuration across at least the United States is a nurse a paramedic. Uh, in, in Europe, more commonly a physician paramedic uh, or physician nurse configuration. Specialty teams are varied and are widely utilized. Uh, pediatric and neonatal teams are probably the most common. There can be high-risk OB teams that come uh, to a facility when it is deemed unsafe to transport a mother in labor, uh, or when you, you know, have a newborn, uh, possibly those OB teams may be combined with a neonatal team to go directly to that facility. Uh, LVADs and ECMOs, uh, as well as uh, balloon pumps, have been increasingly utilized as, uh, as uh, cardiac assist devices that are placed in community settings. Uh, the uh, balloon pumps are actually very commonly transported by uh, air medical crews, uh, sometimes with the use of a technologist that is uh, an, what we call an engineer uh, that uh, specializes in using that. Uh, for some other uh, transport teams, uh, they're uh, actually trained in uh, utilizing that equipment. For example, I use our own shop at Stat Medevac. Uh, we have a 17-base uh, helicopter system. Uh, across uh, Pennsylvania, High and West in uh, Maryland. And uh, all of our, our crews are trained in using balloon pumps and we do those transports commonly. And, and that is also the model at, at a variety of other places. Uh, L, uh, acutely placed uh, uh, left ventricular assist devices are certainly the use of ECMO is typically uh, uh, transported using an engineer. And then transplant, uh, uh, teams uh, can also be utilized uh, as part of an air medical program to retrieve organs and or patients. So the capabilities of nurses or paramedics in this environment actually varies by state, and it varies by state in a, in a very interesting way to the point that you may be in one state, and uh, in that state a nurse can push a paralytic, but a paramedic cannot, and suddenly you fly over a border where the paramedic can push a paralytic, but the nurse cannot. Uh, and in fact, we have one of those borders uh, in uh, this part of the US, uh, which is kind of an interesting situation. Typically, the regulations are set up based on wherever an air medical program is based out of. So for example, we have a multi-state air medical program, but we're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So our protocols are funneled from uh, within this region through our regional EMS council, then to the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and then they're utilized regardless of uh, what um, uh, of uh, you know what area uh, they're involved in. 
Um, but in terms of licensing, in terms of providers having to be licensed in those states and the air medical service having to be licensed in those states, the regulations vary. And so, for example, we have to hold uh, licenses in uh, in uh, you know Maryland and in, in Washington D.C. and in uh, in a number of other places uh, to be able to operate in those environments. So this is something that, as an EMS medical director, you would want to review with your uh, operational staff and. Uh, make sure that everything is ship shape. So potential indications for a medical transport from a scene include cases of time-dependent conditions and or the need for critical care interventions. In this distinction, these two questions that come to play when you have to make a decision about whether to use air medical critical care transport are really two distinct and different questions. Do you need to use the air medicine capabilities for a time savings and or do you need to use the medical crew available in an air medical transport for the critical care interventions that they can provide? That may be the availability to do rapid sequence induction if the patient deteriorates or when you arrive on the, on the scene or in your facility. That may be the capability of blood product administration that's not commonly carried on the ground but may be on an air medical uh, asset. Uh, and uh, that may be, you know, a variety of other medications, interventions that may be delivered by a critical care or medical service that is not otherwise available. And it turns out that these assets have to be available in a regional uh, setting. Uh, it would be nice for us to have a critical care transport group available at every single hospital, uh, even they're not available for every couple hospitals. So these are typically regional assets. And so, you know, as, as uh, what we uh, uh, mentioned to referring physicians is to have those two considerations in mind. Determine if you need a critical care uh, transport, uh, then see how that might be available. You may have that available by ground or you may only have that available by air. And then determine if you need the air simply because you have a time-dependent condition, even if interventions aren't necessarily being uh, uh, immediately performed. Uh, other reasons that air medical transport is utilized is because of a lack or limited availability of ground resources. So in some cases, you may be about an hour, hour and a half away from a hospital. You need to get the patient to that hospital uh, setting. Let's say that somebody needs to go to a tertiary care center for trauma services, uh, but you're an hour and a half away. Uh, you uh, serve a smaller area with a small community hospital that is not capable of transporting a trauma patient. Let's say that you have somebody that may be okay sitting in an ambulance for an hour and 15 or an hour and 30 minutes. But uh, unfortunately, you're the only ALS provider in your region. And if you uh, drive that patient, that hour and 15, hour and 30 minutes, uh, that time on scene, that time at the facility, that time coming back, your service area will be without ALS services for three hours, for example. And so an air medical asset may need to come to pick up that patient, transport them to the trauma center, purely because there are not enough resources to do a long distance ground transport. In some cases, there may be traffic or other road conditions uh, that may make a shorter transport uh, more important. So if uh, you have uh, a patient going from one hospital to another hospital, but they're only separated by a bridge or a tunnel, and suddenly that's under construction and backed up. It may take you an hour, hour and a half to get a short distance, and sometimes air transport is necessary in those conditions. And so we've, we've covered essentially uh, some of the uh, needs as well for a medical transport. And uh, additionally here, there may be some uh, specialty uh, services that are nearized, that are needed that would not otherwise be available on a ground unit, like the specialty teams and other things. So some contraindications to transport uh, have to do with safety. So if you have unsafe weather, uh, that would be the first reason not to transport somebody by air. Uh, certainly there may be some size restrictions about uh, what uh, size patients can be moved uh, in different aircraft. Uh, I know we operate the Eurocopter EC-135 and EC-145. We have transported a 700 kilogram plus patient in an EC-135 and an 1100 kilogram patient in an EC-145. Uh, so often this becomes a matter of girth and size more than it does a matter of weight, which is just a factor of how much fuel you're carrying on uh, and certainly, the, you know, the capabilities of the aircraft, these are a twin engine aircraft with a lot of lift power, uh, 
so uh, if you uh, work in an aeromedical program, you should know what restrictions you have for size, girth to actually fit them in to that space. In some cases, height, particularly for those that are side loading aircraft, uh, you actually uh, may have some restrictions or limitations about how you load the patient uh, in uh, that environment. Uh, and so those are all uh, safety and operational considerations. Some uh, medical considerations is, you know, we, we will typically say that the two groups of patients that are uh, not stable for air medical transport are those that don't have an airway and those with active compressions. So those are most commonly uh, the ones that we may arrive to a scene and we say, nope, we're going to go by ground to the closest facility because for some reason we're not able to establish an airway, which is quite rare. Uh, or uh, more commonly, that somebody has a cardiac arrest and uh, we uh, don't achieve ROSC, uh, somebody has active compressions. And to provide active compressions uh, in a helicopter is challenging. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons where we may just go to the closest facility by the fastest means possible, and often that may be by ground. Um, certainly, uh, newer devices like mechanical CPR devices uh, have uh, changed the game a little bit there. Uh, particularly when you may consider transporting somebody for uh, uh, eCPR, being able to put somebody on ECMO and doing other uh, advanced capabilities. Certainly these are things that are still rarely but uh, increasingly being utilized. Uh, and so there may be some cases where you may want to do CPR and go to another center. Uh, for example, another case that may come up is when you have somebody who's shot in the chest or has a significant uh, a traumatic wound where uh, unless you get that person to a trauma center uh, it, where they're going to have capabilities for, for example, maybe a thoracotomy or other things, uh, then um, there really is not going to be a chance of survival. Uh, and so that may be another rare um, uh, occurrence where uh, you may take somebody who's borderline or even uh, really a, 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 just starting uh, going into cardiac arrest. Uh, and try to do a longer transport in a short period of time by getting the patient into an aircraft. And finally, we mentioned uh, patients in active labor. This can be particularly challenging, uh, certainly when uh, you're, the, uh, you're the medical director and you get a consultation and say, I have a woman, she's in active labor, she's five centimeters, she's having contractions every five minutes, uh, she's, uh, uh, she's uh, you know, having uh, you know, no active urge to push, but, you know, really, you know, the, the contractions have been getting a little bit faster, and is it safe to transport the patient? And there really are no guidelines to say, you know, this is exactly when it's safe and when it's not safe. Uh, there are certainly some situations where somebody is, you know, minimally dilated and, you know, having uh, wide apart contractions where I think it's black and white, it's, it's uh, safe to transport. There's some other cases where, boy, that hospital really wants to get that patient out of that a small community setting where maybe there is an OB or maybe this is a high-risk delivery, maybe it's a, a preterm labor, uh, and we really need to want to get that person to the Mecca where they're going to have all those neonatal, you know, um, maternal fetal medicine capabilities and, um, uh, and really try to push you out the door. And it can become a challenge to decide uh, if somebody is safe for transport. Uh, you know, the only guidance that I have is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, experience and, and seeing uh, what your distances are, and, and just have a really good uh, story and, and, and uh, uh, history from uh, what's going on uh, from the folks that you have there on scene, as well as uh, involving folks like maternal fetal medicine at the receiving facility uh, to come up with a decision and determine if it's uh, likely that this person's going to transport, or excuse me, going to deliver in the next 30 or 60 minutes. Some limitations of air transport is, is that uh, aircraft by the nature can be uh, crowded, claustrophobic, noisy. There's a lot of vibrations, and it's interesting, the vibration piece of it actually wears people down a lot. So when you look at uh, causes of fatigue for uh, air medical uh, transport crews as well as uh, for patients themselves, uh, the vibrations have actually been cited as being a substantial uh, kind of wear on flight crews. So if you have uh, uh, an air medical crew that maybe has done two or three back-to-back -back missions, they were long transport, so they were actually in the air for maybe an hour at a time. Uh, and so now they've just had maybe six hours of flight time uh, in a short period of time. Uh, you, you know, if you've done that, you will feel beat. I mean, you will, you will feel like you just, uh, you know, you just worked uh, two days. And, uh, and um, 
certainly that is not just the vibrations, but the fact that you're doing a lot of activity in a short period of time, probably lifting patients on in and out of the aircraft and doing a number of other things, but that's one of the things to consider. Uh, temperature can also be uh, a particular concern. Uh, this, uh, you know, has come up uh, frequently uh, in, uh, you know, potential answers to questions of things that you may want to mitigate uh, for patients. So as you go up to uh, altitude, temperatures do get colder. We'll review that in uh, some flight physiology points, uh, but uh, this is something that you need to uh, be mindful of and make sure the patient's warm. Uh, and conversely, uh, over the, in the summer, uh, you know, you uh, may or may not have a great air conditioning system in the aircraft. And if you don't, uh, then you can really get into some extremes of heat, depending on where you're located. And that is also uh, something that needs to be measured. And CAMES, which is the accreditation uh, group for air medical uh, transport services, or the, the one that is most uh, utilized by air medical services, uh, actually requires the uh, assessment and documentation of ambient temperatures during transport uh, and a process to mitigate and to review cases where uh, there is an extreme of temperature, either too cold or too hot for the patient. Some points on scene rendezvous and helistops. So it's common for ground EMS to rendezvous with an aircraft in a variety of scene locations. We mentioned how those locations should have a space of at least 100 by 100 feet and be free of uh, dangers around that environment. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes they'll say, hey, you know, where should we set up this LZ? Uh, should we use that parking lot? Should we use that ball field? Should we, oh, wait a minute there's a helipad right there from the hospital that we're not going to go to because they don't have a trauma service there. Uh, but boy, wouldn't it be convenient if we could just land the helicopter right on that H. And so uh, 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 helicopters uh, do this very commonly. Uh, it is okay to rendezvous at a helipad. Uh, the uh, kind of crude term for that is a helistop. And uh, 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 in some cases, the hospitals will have agreement with the EMS agencies to uh, be able to use that helipad uh, as just a rendezvous point. Uh, and an important thing that has come up in the past is to say, well, wait a minute, I just stepped onto hospital property. That helipad is owned by the, by the hospital. It is part of that hospital uh, grounds. You know, uh, aren't I committing an EMTALA violation because I have, uh, I have, quote, arrived at the hospital? And it turns out that that is not the case, uh, that you, as long as the uh, patient and, uh, and uh, EMS crew are not seeking care at that facility, then the EMTALA obligation has not been uh, kind of enacted uh, because they are literally just using that space to rendezvous with a helicopter and have not sought care at that facility. Uh, so uh, there is no EMTALA obligation. Now, on the other hand, if suddenly uh, medical providers from the, uh, from the uh, hospital come out and begin assessing the patient, well, whether they ask for it or not, uh, the hospital arrives to the patient. Uh, and in those cases, you need to be very mindful about uh, making sure that you, uh, you secure a hospital-to-hospital -hospital transfer with an accepting physician, availability of beds, transfer documentation, insurance stability of the patient, and all of those things that are key to EMTALA. Uh, but as long as it's physically just a pad being utilized, then that's uh, uh, done and, and not an issue. Risks and costs, I'll, I'll mention just briefly here so we can get to some uh, flight physiology things. Uh, something that's been on a lot of minds, you know, sky-high bills, it's on the papers periodically. Uh, transport uh, our cost charges range anywhere between $10,000 or $50,000. Uh, is it cost-effective? Is it uh, reasonable? Uh, certainly, there's some programs that have, you know, high sky high bills. Other programs that are able to uh, maintain costs and charges uh, down. There have been a couple of papers published as recently as 2012 in JAMA that have looked at the um, quality adjusted life year saved through air medical transport, and it's about $15,000. So most medical interventions that are less costly than $50,000 per quality uh, is typically deemed to be cost effective. Uh, the argument that I could get into or somebody could get into uh, with this is uh, how are these patients selected and certainly the cost effectiveness is uh, more for those who are critically ill and less for those who are not ill. That is the truth for any uh, 
service, whether it's that you're admitting somebody to an ICU or you're you know, providing any other care, if they're going to do okay anyway, then that's uh, just a, a cost that was unnecessary. So it continues to be important that we triage patients appropriately and utilize this resource in an appropriate manner. Other issues are whether you know it's uh, uh, too risky to fly somebody. Helicopters crash. I saw one on TV. You know, I'm worried about putting somebody in a helicopter. I'm going to put them in an ambulance instead. And so, you know, um, uh, the, what I, I call this to be uh, a little bit of the the commercial airline phenomenon, right? So you remember at some points of my family saying, "Oh my goodness." You know, and, you know, actually, this is probably more more the case maybe 20, 30 years ago, where you say, oh, an aircraft, uh, you know, a commercial aircraft crashed. Oh, you know, flying on commercial aircraft is unsafe. I, you know, I don't want to get on an airplane uh, and realize that it's just such a rare occurrence uh, compared to all of the transports that exist. However, we have had a rash of uh, helicopter crashes that have occurred. And so let's compare this to the uh, fatal accident rate for general aviation, which is about 1.1% per 100,000 flight hours and realize that it's about uh, uh, the same for uh, helicopter EMS aircraft. So it's the same thing as general aviation in terms of risk of being up in the air. Uh, but let's compare it with ground transport because you can really Google ambulance crash and find the latest uh, ones uh, from a number of, uh, you know, from anywhere. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we have an average one ambulance crash per day in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and that just doesn't make the news all that often unless it happens in your neck of the woods. Um, so what's the risk to the patient for ground EMS? If you look at the published literature, uh, you come out with about 0 0.02 deaths per 100,000 miles, and this is recognizing that there's a gross underreporting of injuries and fatalities uh, on ambulances because there's no mandated reporting. So even accepting the fact that you have uh, underreporting of now, fatalities and injuries on ambulances, uh, that's what the published uh, death rate per 100,000 miles would be if you calculate it. And for air medical services, you essentially come out with the same thing. Uh, when you talk about uh, per distance traveled, it's about 0 0.02 deaths per 100,000 miles. And in this case, all deaths that occur from air medical services are required or mandated to be reported, uh, so a little bit more accurate. But even if we take the numbers uh, to be accurate for both groups, you see that uh, you know, just because we're putting somebody in ambulance doesn't mean it's all that much safer. So take that from an air medical guy, but, uh, but uh, certainly I think that folks need to look at the numbers uh, when they think about that risk. And uh, there are many ways to mitigate the transport. You can use instrument flight rule uh, capabilities, um, you, which allows you to fly through the clouds and with limited visibility, uh, ability to have night vision goggles, uh, GPS approaches, uh, having the twin engines, as I mentioned, having information systems, including traffic coll uh, collision avoidance systems and enhanced ground uh, proximity warning systems. This is basically in your helmet, suddenly you say, you know, aircraft, aircraft, aircraft. Uh, and it tells you that half a mile out, you have an aircraft uh, and you need to know where it is and make sure that it's not on your flight path or they're in yours. Um, so moving on to some flight physiology pieces, I'm just going to give you some of the nuts and bolts of what you need. Again, this is prime fodder for anybody who might want to sit down for an EMS-related exam in the near future of a few months from now. Uh, so recognize that uh, you know, our atmosphere is up to 70,000 feet. Uh, nitrogen makes up about 70% of air, and the other majority is oxygen, which is roughly 21%, with a little bit of everything else mixed in. And this is what happens when you go up in altitude. Your barometric pressure decreases. The partial pressure of oxygen decreases, gases expand, and temperature falls. And here, just as a comparison, how much does it fall? So for about every couple thousand feet, you drop a degree Celsius. So not a huge difference in and of itself, but certainly uh, somewhat of a measurable difference uh, there. So we're going to talk a little bit about some gas laws. Again, this is prime fodder uh, that uh, uh, folks like to look at and, in fact, are related to the medical conditions you need to be uh, thinking about and concerned about when you do our medical transport. We'll discuss specifically about how that is more important for those that are doing fixed wing missions where the cabin pressure is certainly much higher than on a, a helicopter transport. And so uh, that's something to be very cognizant of what is the uh, flying altitude that you will be at physiologically 
uh, in terms of actually potentially having to make some calculations to be ready for that mission. So Boyle's Law has to do with expansion, and specifically it's the volume of gas uh, being inversely proportioned to pressure when temperature remains constant. In fact, as you go up into altitude, as temperature decreases, uh, in theory, uh, volume should decrease as well, but this proportional change is actually much greater than the impact of temperature uh, uh, as you go up, as you decrease pressure. So even if you don't maintain temperature constant, for that one degree Celsius difference that I told you about that happens with about every 2,000 feet, uh, still the volume expansion wins. Boyle's law beats, uh, beats uh, temperature uh, changes. So um, uh, be mindful of that. And this is important for any gas in an enclosed space that will expand as you go up to higher altitude. Now the body is typically adaptable to about 10,000 feet. 10,000 feet is pushing it. 8,000 feet is the typical, between six and 8,000 feet is the typical cabin pressure of a commercial aircraft. And really at about 8,000 feet, you're starting to push it with certain patients that have chronic conditions uh, in terms of, of oxygen. And also, not that not being related to this law, but even when you have some expansion of folks that maybe are uh, post op from laparotomy I and mean, still have some uh, gas in the air, or even may have some flatus and whatnot, you do see some expansion of a gas that may cause some abdominal and intestinal pain that may cause expansion of some other issues. For example, in the tracheal tubes, well, these are filled with air, and the pilot, you know, cuff is filled with air, and if you're uh, flying at altitude, you may need to be concerned about that expanding, that rupturing, that causing tracheal damage, uh, causing an air leak and difficulty with ventilation. So a couple things can be done to mitigate it. One is to actually carry a manometer where you test the uh, pressure and maintain it at a certain amount once you, you know, as you are reaching altitude. Another way to do it is to inflate the cuff with air, and then there's no change in volume as you go up uh, into air. Uh, also applies to hyperbaric chambers. Uh, so if you are placing somebody in a hyperbaric chamber, chamber and you're changing the uh, uh, functional pressure of them, typically in a hyperbaric chamber, you will um, uh, put them under much greater pressure, well then the volume will decrease uh, in size and so now you may need to have a, a mechanism to uh, to mitigate that uh, and so commonly when you have an uh, intubated patient going into a hyperbaric chamber, you'll have to make sure that that cuff is inflated with water and not with air or it'll just cause an air leak because it's not appropriately inflated at the higher pressure. Intravenous strips are important to be mindful of. Uh, as air expands, if it's an enclosed space, your flow can increase. So this is, makes it particularly important to have intravenous strips on pumps that, are, uh, that uh, can regulate and are not affected by that flow uh, difference. Splints like vacuum splints, another thing you need to be mindful of, may suddenly become much tighter uh, or deflate depending on whether you're ascending or descending. Transport ventilators must be prepared to be utilized uh, in flight and must be uh, rated to, to be able to adjust for changes in uh, ambient pressure. Uh, and uh, then we have patients that actually have uh, physiological, uh, you know, air pockets. And so here we see somebody with a pneumothorax. So, you know, what's going to happen when somebody with a pneumothorax during transport in, air, in a helicopter? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, uh, certainly going up to uh, a great altitude, you're going to have expansion of that pneumothorax. A question that comes up then is, is it just unsafe to put a patient with any pneumothorax into any kind of air medical vehicle? And so then you have to ask yourself, how much does the volume of a pneumothorax or really any uh, pocket uh, of air uh, expand as you go up in altitude? And you can actually calculate this. So it turns out that uh, for a flight level about 6,000 feet, you actually increase the volume of that space by about 25%. It becomes between 30 and 33%, to remind myself, when you get up to 8,000 feet, which is common for commercial aircraft. So yes, if you have a pneumothorax, you're about to put that patient in, in a commercial aircraft, uh, you, you need to you know, think twice uh, because you, you will have an expansion of a third the size of that pneumothorax as they go up. And uh, certainly, you know, there, rec there are uh, recommendations for when not to put people with uh, recent pneumothoraces on commercial aircraft. 
typically at least one to two weeks after radiographic resolution of the pneumothorax. Uh, but uh, in some cases, you may be on an island, you may need to fly somebody uh, to get to another medical center and they have a pneumothorax and there's nothing you can do about it, but maybe dart the chest. Uh, and so you need to be mindful that that pneumothorax could expand and, you know, what are you going to do? Certainly it would make more sense to place a chest tube in uh, before you put that person in an aircraft. On the other hand, most helicopters either fly below 2,000 feet or can fly below 2,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and so uh, in those situations, they will uh, have a less than 5% increase. And if you're not flying uh, near sea level, so if you're already on a mountain, then you just need to figure out how much above your current, your current uh, altitude you're going to be flying. So, you know, if you actually need to go above a ridge where you're going to be flying up higher at, you know, maybe uh, five or 6,000 feet, well, suddenly you're going to get into the same issue that you would get into uh, doing a fixed wing. So typically for uh, most uh, helicopter transports that are going relatively low to the ground, so somewhere between one and 2,000 feet, uh, pneumothorax doesn't really expand all that much, and the air medical piece of it doesn't actually uh, become that important uh, physiologically, but certainly going up at higher altitudes, it's something that you have to calculate and be ready to address. Dalton's law talks about partial pressures and that the total pressure of mixture of gases is equal to some of the partial pressures of each gas in that mixture. So what this basically means is that as altitude increases, the atmospheric pressure decreases, so the total pressure decreases, and then the uh, total content of oxygen essentially decreases as you go up into air. So even though the fraction of uh, oxygen, so, so the, the percent of oxygen is still 21% uh, up at altitude, the total content of oxygen in the air has decreased. And how much does that happen? So if we take, for example, at, uh, you know, you can see here at sea level five and 10,000 feet, you have a third decrease in the PO2 uh, of patients. So it certainly can worsen hypoxia. Now, this is commonly uh, encountered uh, when you have people with chronic lung conditions that may go on a commercial aircraft. Their oxygen saturation may be 98% at uh, sea level, it'd be 87% at uh, 10,000 feet. Uh, certainly, if there's a depressurization or something, we'll all get hypoxic in the air. So how can we increase it? We can provide more oxygen. We can increase the atmospheric pressure and descend. So this is a limited problem, again, for helicopters that don't fly all that high. It's more of a problem for fixed-wing aircraft that do go high, and so supplemental oxygen use is often used for critically ill patients. Some advantages of pressurized cabins uh, related to the, to the laws that we have just talked about are that you can limit the, um, uh, the increase in size of uh, gastrointestinal trapped gas. Uh, it can help with temperature, humidity, ventilation. Uh, you don't need to worry about additional oxygen and the fatigue and discomfort, things like that. Certainly it adds structural weight and maintenance and other issues. So uh, Dalton's Law in Action, their COPD level, uh, oxygen saturation was 95% on commercial aircraft. You go up to 8,000 feet, which is common, and now at 86%, that person's short of breath. Solution is that on many commercial aircraft, they provide uh, the capability to set up a portable oxygen concentrator. Uh, this is very different from just showing up at the gate and saying, hey, I heard you have oxygen on the airplane. I'm just going to use that. That's not going to get you very far. In fact, it will get you off the airplane. Uh, and uh, uh, something uh, like a portable oxygen concentrator has to set, be set up a few days in advance. So, you know, warn your uh, uh, loved ones and your patients. Um, all right, Henry's law uh, has to do with uh, dissolving gases in a solution, uh, being proportional to the pressure over the gas in the solution. So this is what happens when you open up a car Coke can, when the pressure suddenly decreases because it equilibrates from the environment, then gas tries to come up out of solution and it's clinically important for decompression uh, sickness where nitrogen has made it into the body, uh, for example, during scuba diving, and uh, as you uh, go up into altitude, then there is uh, some of that kind of fizzling out of solution. So let's take the example of your scuba diver uh, that, uh, you know, uh, with scuba diving, didn't uh, had no problems, then suddenly has a traumatic injury, has to be flown off from one island to another island, and as you get them into uh, altitude, that suddenly they start experiencing the bends. Uh, and typically this is painful joints, uh, can be attributed with neurologic symptoms and uh, other issues. So uh, for these folks, we wanna descend uh, best we can 
and then actually typically we'll use a hyperbaric chamber to get them back uh, to where they were before. Typically, uh, for a single non-decompression dive, you want a minimum of 12 hours before flying, and for multiple dives or any stages of ascent, at least 24 hours. Graham's law has to do with um, gases diffusing from higher or lower concentrations. Um, uh, this is a little bit less touched on, on on flight physiology, but it does have to do with the use of heliox, of why it becomes uh, useful to uh, utilize a combination of gases uh, where the oxygen will diffuse more easily uh, because of the uh, density of helium uh, versus oxygen. Charles' law has to do with uh, 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 when pressure is constant, that the volume of a gas is proportional uh, to its uh, temperature, um, and uh, gases expand as they're heated, like in a uh, like they would in a, a pressure cooker. Uh, if, uh, you know, could uh, be related to an explosion, the, the gases will suddenly want to expand. And Gay-Lussac's law is a little bit related to that. Pressure and temperature are directly related when volume is constant. So the classic uh, example of this is if you um, talk to, uh, you know, you, you uh, finish your shift uh, and you uh, transition over the aircraft to uh, the night team, and it's, you know, 5 p.m., it's been a hot day, you look at the oxygen cylinder, it, oh, that looks at about, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 1,900 PSI, it's full, that's good. When the crew comes uh, to check the aircraft the next morning, uh, they realize that you're down maybe at 1,800 PSI, and you might say, hmm, that's 100 uh, PSI difference. Uh, you know, is there a leak in the tank? Uh, and the difference is that no, the temperature has just decreased by 10, 20, you know, 10, 15 degrees, uh, and actually the pressure will therefore decrease uh, directly with that as well. So there we go, uh, air medical transport and flight physiology. Uh, some of the things that we've talked about is that air medical transport requires substantial attention to operation, to understanding the environment, to understanding the unique challenges uh, and issues that have to do not just with the operations, but also the impacts of altitude on the patient, the impacts of the whole environment on both patient and providers, and how you manage those situations and mitigate the negative impacts of it. Uh, certainly we, as clinicians that work in the pre-hospital setting, need to be uh, familiar with aircraft limitations, what their aircraft uh, and operating characteristics are, uh, when it's safe to use them, uh, and uh, when we would use different assets. Uh, the altitude physiology is prime fodder for questions. So next time you're cramming for that board exam, make sure that you review some gas laws for yourself uh, and be familiar with how to apply that to some concrete examples. Uh, and finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention crew resource management. So it's an essential component to how you mitigate all of these issues uh, that can happen, making sure that the flight crews and the pilots are well in sync uh, that uh, people are uh, working in an environment where they feel comfortable with saying no to a flight uh, where, you know, they have uh, principles like it takes, you know, it takes three to go and one to say no uh, to be able to uh, make sure that the operations of an aircraft are safe uh, and then you mitigate other issues uh, that may uh, come across. And that is all. Uh, so we'll open it up for uh, any questions. So Chris, this is Derek. Just just out of curiosity, do you guys replace the uh, air with uh, stir water in your endotracheal tubes for rotor wing, uh, or is just exclusively for uh, fixed wing, or do you guys simply monitor the pressures? Yeah, we do not. Um, we actually don't uh, don't manage don't uh, change them at all. Uh, and that's because we'll typically fly about 2,000 feet, and uh, just going through those equations, uh, that's less than a 5% difference in volume. Uh, so we don't think that that's physiologically uh, impactful for our transport differences or transport distances. Uh, and uh, and just you know just based on uh, uh, you know the amount of uh, uh, air and, and whatnot that we're currently utilizing. I don't think that uh, most people's kind of sensitivity of how much air you're putting into that balloon is even within, you know, 5% of when we did it the last time. Uh, so it probably doesn't matter. But for sure, and we do fixed-wing missions, um, whenever we do a fixed-wing mission, that is one of those considerations. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, we'll typically either use a manometer or potentially filling it with uh, water. But more commonly, I think what's utilized in the fixed wing setting is actually the use of a manometer. With no other questions, it must be that everyone's an air medical uh, expert. Good job. All right. Well, we, we uh, accomplished the mission then. <laughs> Very good. Well, right. I appreciate uh, everybody coming on today, and uh, hopefully it was helpful for some folks and some other folks to catch this online and be helpful to them as well. So um, uh, just as a reminder, there's a Facebook page uh, where people can make comments and take a look. Uh, the uh, Upstate Emergency Medicine website has uh, direct links to the uh, webinars, but we also have a YouTube uh, channel, which actually folks could subscribe to directly um, if they're uh, into YouTube or have a YouTube app. Uh, they may be, uh, be able to see it directly that way. Um, the next, our next uh, MS Medicine Live uh, is again on a Tuesday at 1 p.m., and it'll be July 28th. So we're hoping to see all you guys come back for that, and uh, hopefully we'll get all the fellows popping in on that one as well. So uh, thanks very much uh, for attending EMS Medicine Live, and we'll see you next time.